Cornet playing, like any other art, requires a long, intensive study. There is no short cut. From the very beginning, a student should be taught on proper lines. Faulty habits in playing and errors of style which are so easily acquired when one is young are not so easy to correct in later years. It's because of this that good early training is so important. There are perhaps three essentials in cornet playing. Firstly, a good quality of tone. The importance of this would at once be evident. The better the sound, the more likely you are to command the attention of your listeners. Secondly, a competent technique. Without this, you can never hope to play with the facility required of a soloist, or even to give a good account of yourself in your band or orchestra. Thirdly, a sensitive musicianship, which is really the stamp of the true artist. This aptitude or feeling for style is perhaps largely inborn, but it can certainly be cultivated with proper guidance. A splendid help in developing a good sense of style is to listen whenever you can to the great artists of the world. Artistry in music will tell in every bar whatever the instrument. In this illustrated talk, you will hear many facets of cornet playing, many types of work that a cornetist can expect to meet in the ordinary way. You will hear examples of legato playing, staccato, double and triple tonguing, arpeggios, and various kinds of grace notes, to mention but a few. All the illustrations have been specially written. Let us begin with a bold martial passage marked Resoluto. You would notice how firm the attack is. And now another example that suggests a touch of pageantry. Such bold passages naturally call for a firm, bold style. Now, a complete contrast. Note the gentle use of the tongue in the following Mark Cantabile, or in a singing style. That obviously calls for what we term the soft tongue. The syllable used is da da da, altogether a softer touch than was used in the first example. Here is another tune, this time in a minor key which is played in the same gentle manner. The tongue is to a brass instrument what a bow is to a violin, and like a bow it can be used in many different ways. Notes can be struck really hard or gently caressed according to the character of the music. Trills are sometimes badly played because the player himself doesn't listen carefully enough and allows the notes to become irregular. Sometimes even the intonation suffers. Here is a simple trill from B to C. Note how the trill is begun slowly and then breaks into speed, but not too fast. A reasonable speed at which you can hear every note is what is required. Push your vowels well down and remember that once you reach the desired speed, it should be kept very even. Here's another example from E to F.
6-8 time is not so easy to play absolutely correctly as most people think. Listen to this simple quaver passage. Now listen to the same tune played in a different rhythm, in 2-4 time. To differentiate between those two rhythms and to be able to play each correctly is a real problem for the student, and often for the older player as well. While the 6-8 requires a good sense of judgment, the 2-4 rhythm is technically the more difficult. In this, the semiquaver and the note following are so close together that it requires a very smart tongue action to get round it. Listen to this little mazurka-like piece in 3-4. And another example in the same lather rhythm. That dotted rhythm is frequently met with. Make sure you get your note values as accurate as possible. Slurring in legato work is very important. The notes should be joined as smoothly as possible without any semblance of a break. and another singable passage. Now, let us turn to some staccato playing. Scales really well done are a delight to listen to. These are in C major. Note how even and unhurried they are. Indeed, the beauty of scales is in their uniformity. The notes are crisp, as they should be, but not so short as to destroy their musical value. Now here are more scales in A-flat, played legato or slurred. Note how each octave group is played with one stroke of the tongue, or, as a violinist would play it, with one sweep of the bow. <laughs> equally important and equally interesting are arpeggios. As in the case of scales, they must be played very evenly and in a confident style. Listen to these in B-flat, staccato. <laughs> Slurring in arpeggios is more difficult. Here is an example in E-flat. these slurred passages, the lip muscles are kept extremely busy. The ear too must be alert, and you should really be able to hear, mentally, the notes before they're actually played. In other words, the ear must be one jump ahead of the fingers. One of the more advanced types of exercises on a cornet, or on any other brass instrument for that matter, is slurring over different intervals 
by using the lip muscles only without the aid of the tongue or using the valves. You will of course know that in the same way that certain notes of the same pitch can be produced on a violin by using different strings, so many notes on the cornet are obtained by use of different valves. We call this enharmonic fingering. Take this simple example using three notes only, G, B and D. Instead of the normal fingering, open second and first, let us depress both the first and third valves for all these three notes. Now listen to an extension of the same exercise in quick time. In the middle of it, we change to G, C and E, all open notes, which means that the lip muscles and not the valves are doing the work. Here is another example of a lip exercise, again using mainly harmonic fingering. We've already had two examples of trills. These were, of course, affected by the use of the valves. But trilling, using the lips only, is an entirely different matter, much more difficult. Here is a lip trill from G to A, both notes being enharmonically fingered first and third. Now back to a little slow music. Grace notes should be played with a very light touch and, as their name implies, gracefully. The timing is important. They must be dovetailed so as not to upset the flow of the music. Here is a bar crawl type of tune, first without any grace notes. Now an extension of the same little tune with the embellishments added. See how naturally these seem to fall into place. Here is another type of grace note slurring over an interval to the principal note. This must be done with the utmost care. The gruppetto, or turn, another form of embellishment, is quite often called for. This requires an artistic sense of judgment in order to gauge the notes so that they really sound part of the music. Listen to this example. When this embellishment falls between a dotted crotchet and a quaver in 2-4 or in common time, a triplet group comes into play. 
Listen first of all to this short melody without any tones. Now we'll try that tune again, just as before, and then repeat it with the turns. You will, of course, have noticed how these embellishments are not allowed to interfere with the time or with the fluency of the melody. Yet another of the many kinds of grace notes is the acciaccatura, or crushing note. Although very short, this little note shoulders the burden of the accent. In other words, it is always on the beat. Listen to this. Evenness in triplet groups is often a stumbling block to beginners. In this example, the triplets are purposely not played exactly as they should be. In fact, they tend to sound like two semiquavers followed by a quaver. That unevenness is not an uncommon fault. Now listen to the same passage played properly. See how regular the notes are. You can count them in threes for yourself. This brings us to triple tonguing. It is the ambition of almost every beginner to be able to triple tongue. But it's a mistake, I think, to begin too soon. You should try to master single tonguing first, or at least until you can achieve a good, clean line of semiquavers, four to a beat, at about this pace. In triple tonguing, the syllables used are tu tu ku, the last being a kind of backward motion of the tongue. This last syllable, ku, must match perfectly the other two. And it's just this that makes triple tonguing difficult to do well. Although, once you get the knack of it, like riding a bicycle or swimming, it's surprisingly easy. From the point of view of clean playing, there should be no difference between triple tonguing and single tonguing. Both should sound the same, apart, of course, from triple tonguing generally being the faster. Practice it slowly at first, alternating with short groups of single tonguing. This will help you to ensure absolute regularity. Then gradually increase the speed. Listen to this example in which single tonguing is used until the pace becomes too fast, when it is merged into triple tonguing. See whether you can discover exactly where this changeover occurs. Did you spot it? I'm sure you didn't. Running triplets are more difficult to play and require a great deal of practice. Listen to this. Triple tonguing in arpeggio passages too is no simple matter, although it may sound deceptively easy. Triple-tonguing polkas have always been popular with cornet players. Here is a typical example. A 
And here is another short characteristic cornet piece, a little melody in 3-4 time, followed by a triple tonguing variation. You'll observe how the tune in the variation is slightly emphasised. Now we come to double tonguing, in which the syllables are tuku tuku. As in the case of triple tonguing, the notes must be very even and regular. Here is an example of merging the single tonguing into double tonguing. Now, a passage where double tonguing would be essential. That is the kind of part one finds in gallops and certain types of quick dances. Here is an example of the double tongue used in scale work marked presto. Intervals are often a bugbear to students and even to many experienced players. They are difficult to play with facility and they require great flexibility of the lip muscles which only comes with methodical practice. You will note in these examples that the moving part, the melodic line if you like, is slightly more prominent than the reiterated G's. Listen for yourself. In the next example of intervals, the articulation is a little unusual, a downward slur being employed throughout. Many cornet solos include a cadenza, and most of the older type of solos have two or three. Cadenzas, whether for cornet, violin, voice or piano, allow a certain liberty to the soloist. He is able to play in freestyle, generally unrestricted by bar lines. In many of the popular operatic arias, cadenzas were included not so much for the sake of the music, but as an added flourish to allow famous singers to display their technique, in other words, to show off a little. Indeed, many performers invented their own. The more musical type of cadenza, however, is usually based on material that has already been heard. It really grows out of the music. The example which follows comes out of four bars of melody in common time, which I want you to imagine as the last part of a solo. The actual cadenza starts at the pause on high G, which you will easily recognise.
noticed how groups of notes from the four bars of melody kept recurring, and how the soloist was free to quicken phrases or runs, or slow them down at will. The cornet is a remarkably facile instrument. Scales, both diatonic and chromatic, can be executed on it with the clarity of a grand piano. Listen to the following exercise, played in one long breath and in one long slur. And now a chromatic scale from low F sharp to high C, a range of two and a half octaves, which is regarded as the normal compass of the instrument. This exercise, too, is played in one breath. In earlier times, cornetists and brass players generally were not often called upon to play in the more remote keys. Sharp keys were specially avoided, but today, Composers and arrangers of brass band music are more demanding. They write in every conceivable key, and it is not unusual for a player, particularly in a contest piece, to find himself in B or C sharp major. Now, to end this talk, here in the extreme key of C flat, seven flats, is a short solo. It is elaborated with various kinds of grace notes and contains examples of intervals some florid passages, and even a fluent cadenza. In fact, you will find in it a number of the various techniques we have been discussing.